A long, long, long time ago, I made a video. And in that video, I threw a fit. A fit about Fire Emblem bosses and how they just aren't fun. Everyone agreed with me. We congratulated ourselves in the comment section and moved on with our lives, accepting the fact that Fire Emblem bosses are bad and probably always will be. It just comes with the game. Or at least so I thought. To a certain extent, Fire Emblem doesn't have bosses in the traditional sense. Usually, bosses in Fire Emblem are bosses because of what they represent in the gameplay. They're enemies blocking the seize point, or they're stronger foes at the back who are a win condition, or they're a major villain in the game. Bosses in Fire Emblem are rarely fun, for three main reasons. One, they're stat-inflated enemies. Veterans of the series will surely wince, remembering bosses like Henning, Gomez, and Hyman, who are so statistically powerful that the overwhelming majority of player characters simply cannot fight them. See, the thing about Fire Emblem is that there's no real-time input execution. It's not Mario and Luigi where extra-timed button presses can manipulate battle outcomes. What you see on the battle screen is what you get. Fire Emblem is a number machine. The machine eats your stats and the opponent's stats and spits out a report card. Because of the RNG behind critical hits and hit rates, there can be some surprises, but for the most part, Fire Emblem battles can be predicted before they ever happen. This means that when an enemy is cracked, and I mean really cracked, the primary gameplay is having every character run up to the boss, cycling through every battle forecast, and picking the one that works the best. Imagine, I lay out playing cards face up, from two to ace, and ask you to pick the strongest card. It's not fun. It's not interesting. Sure, one out of every 95 times or so, one of the cards will explode and blow three of your fingers off, but that's nothing more than a jump scare to put some life back into your constitution. Nothing in the rulebook says you have to play the strongest card. You could intentionally throw a two into the machine and see what it does, which some players do, but this isn't good game design. This is detached irony, which is the lowest form of thought and the least interesting way to do anything. And sure, I was in high school once and made out with girls who I bonded with over Inuyasha and not wanting to be an American idiot, but I don't want to go back to that. I got adult things to do, like play Fire Emblem. takes us to number two. They're easy to cheese. On one end, you have stationary bosses that have absurd stats and classes that have no weaknesses like Henning, and on the other, you have every goober and shadow dragon that can be blasted with a forged effective weapon. These buffoons had the unfortunate birthright of being generals and paladins who fold like paper under the bite of forged wing spears, riders' banes, and hammers. Shadow Dragon allows the player to add extra might to any weapon, and if it's an effective weapon, like a bow against flyers or a worm slayer against mana keats, that extra damage gets tripled. Because of enemy class homogeneity in Shadow Dragon, the game goes from frustratingly difficult to a stomp around Chapter 4, even on Hard 5 because of how easy it is to forge a bunch of might on an effective weapon, warp someone to the boss, kill the boss, and then warp Marth to seize. Sure. It's funny to bully these paper tigers, but the novelty wears thin. Sometimes the issue is that bosses are stationary and can't fight back. In Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, few bosses had 1-2 to two range weapons, so you could just sit there with lightning swords and fireballs and slow cook them and they could do nothing about it. Points 1 and 2 are united by the common theme of many bosses being stationary. Because they don't move, higher function problems like enemy phase formation don't matter. Between the absurd bosses and the abused bosses lies a no man's land of forgettable scrubs that get clapped by any old assortment of player characters. These bozos are less frustrating, but they're only fun for the big bag of EXP that waits at the end. On the more extreme end of this spectrum are the myriad of general bosses in Genealogy of the Holy War who represent a unique brand of toxic. Many of these guys have the Pavai skill, which means sometimes, whenever they feel like it, they get to cancel all damage received. 
When you add that with the often sketchy hit rates, it means there are moments where you just don't get to deal damage. Oh, but you sure do take a lot of damage. What compounds this is that these stationary bosses often sit on thrones and gates that give big bonuses to their avoid and sometimes defense. To up the challenge, just to make everything a little bit extra unreliable. So what would the solution be? Well, the seemingly obvious solution would be to allow bosses to move, which brings us to our third problem. Bosses can make objectives easy to cheese. Let's ignore games like Shadow Dragon and Thracia 776 that have infinite warp range, because those games are always easy to cheese. In Chapter 25 of The Blazing Sword, the player has to step on three different switches blocked by bosses. All of these bosses move off of their switches, meaning that you can just run past them to the switches. In other cases, you have the kill boss objective, which asks the player to simply kill the boss. In three houses, it was easy to rush the boss and kill them before the enemy even had a chance to move. This is a common problem with kill boss maps. Alencia's Gambit in Radiant Dawn is famous for how easily its entire challenge can be negated by flying up to Ludvek with Har and Alencia and killing him before the map has even had a chance to truly begin. In some ways, I think the problem is that our brains... Seeing the word boss, seeing that boss emblem, and seeing that big bag of experience gives a heightened importance to bosses that they probably don't need. If anything, it might be a mistake on the part of the series to include a boss with every map. But since the series insists on including a boss in every map, the question remains, are there good bosses, and what can be done to make them better? One of my favorite approaches that the series has done before is tying bosses to special triggers. So, for example, killing the boss in Chapter 15 of The Blazing Sword stops reinforcements. By playing aggressive early and killing the boss, you make the later turns easier and make it easier to grab the chests. This boss, Seelin, is particularly fun because he's a nomad that can run along the wall and he has a longbow, making positioning super important when trying to lure him to a space where you can kill him. He also drops a dragon shield in hard mode, so extra challenge for extra rewards is always a dub. Two bosses that I quite like are Valter and Kalek in Chapter 15 of the Sacred Stones. Both of these bosses are stationary, but they invite the player to commit unconventional actions. Valter is a flyer holding a Philly shield, meaning he isn't weak to arrows, and Kalek is a hero with fairly high crit and himself has a hoplon guard, an item that blocks criticals. Kalek is particularly nasty since a lot of the Sacred Stones cast has low luck. The thing is, though that both the Hoplon Guard and Philly Shield can be stolen. If the player has leveled up Calm or recruited uh, uh, the other guy, you can just pick off those items and completely change the tide of combat. For Valter, this means you can snipe him with a bow, and Kalek, equipped only with axes, can now be targeted and bodied by, say, a Swordmaster with a Killing Edge, while also using the Hoplon Guard against him so he can't critical hit you. What I love about these fights is that the Observant player can use tools, in this case stealing, that boss fights usually ignore. It gives you non-combat options to deal with bosses. The fact that you can turn the Hoplon Guard from Kalex benefit to yours within the fight itself is just the best. This is quite rare though. And obviously you can't use these same tricks every time, otherwise it'll get boring. And boring is just what I thought Fire Emblem bosses would always be. As long as they aren't frustrating, then we're fine. I'll leave it alone. Or at least that's what I thought until Fire Emblem Engage came out. Engage made a couple of small changes that have changed everything. Bosses have gone from boring facts of life to the most exciting fights on each map. The first change is a rather simple one. Many bosses move, but there are no seize maps, so a boss moving off their starting point doesn't allow you to bypass them entirely. Since they often move in cohort with other enemies and player movement is limited for a long time, bosses are almost always going to initiate some enemy phase combat. However, whether or not they initiate combat at some point is moot because one rounding bosses and engage is, generally speaking, impossible. One. The game has introduced a skill called Stalwart that reduces or outright negates effective damage depending on the difficulty. No more forging hammers to one-round general bosses. 2. From Chapter 2 onwards, every boss has at least a second health bar that cannot be damaged until the first is destroyed. 
You cannot, therefore, one round a boss on enemy phase, and to take down on player phase is going to require, at minimum, two characters, but likely more. With hammers and rider's banes no longer being useful against bosses, the next concern is if characters can even damage them. There is some stat creep with the bosses in the game, but Engage gives the player so many tools to work with. Bosses do get extremely tanky, so here are the options, and it's almost always the case that the game makes you use all of these to beat the bosses. The first is backup units. These units can perform chain attacks with other units as long as they're in attacking range of the enemy. Chain attacks always do 10% of the enemy's max health, so they bypass all defensive stats. Secondly, you have engage attacks, which are super powerful moves that can never miss and don't face retaliation. These mean that characters who might otherwise be unable to survive a round of combat with a boss can now contribute. The third big change is the wider systemic addition of break. When you attack an enemy at weapon triangle advantage, they are broken and cannot retaliate during combat or during their next combat. Bosses also cannot retaliate if one of their life bars is depleted mid-combat. This lets the player attack with frailer units because there are so many options to avoid counters. It's genuinely incredible how engaged, just by having bosses say, if that were me personally, I'd just not die, makes them much more tense and interesting fights, while the added mechanics allow and require everyone to get in on the action. Some credit is owed three houses for introducing the idea of multiple health bars. It worked well in that game, but was exclusive to monster enemies. Humans still only had one health bar, which continued to let kill boss maps be trivialized. It's also worth noting that maddening in Engage makes all bosses unbreakable. Mechanically, it is a fine change. It places a bigger emphasis on sequencing attacks, especially with regards to backups and Engage attacks, but it's also a change that makes me sad. On paper, unbreakable bosses require more strategy and are more difficult, which is what maddening promises. But, like, break is part of Engage, and seeing it taken away at higher difficulties is not unlike the warp staff being removed from New Mystery of the Emblem Lunatic. Sure, it makes the game more challenging and doesn't make it unfair, and it's only one plank, but it's still a plank of the Theseus. Should a game's unique mechanics be stripped for the sake of challenge? That's like, that's like a discussion question or something. Please submit your short answers responses in the comment section below. Where will Fire Emblem boss design go from here? I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be surprised to see the multiple health bars stay, along with a continued de-emphasis on the kill single boss maps. For now though, the series is about 1 for 18 on bosses. Or, to be simple, Fire Emblem is the Billy Hamilton of boss design. When it's bad, it's bad. But on those rare occasions where everything works, it's like going supernova. And it makes you forgive and forget everything else.